Okay, hi everybody. This is our second podcast here, Velocity and uh, Dark Horse collaborating to talk about all things cycling. And um, I think we want to just touch in on a few things. Number one, we don't want to turn the show into some kind of political movement. Um, we just want to chat about cycling. However, we do recognize that we can play an active part in maybe educating each other and and we want to take a moment just to acknowledge the things that are going on in the world and um, the uh, issues with race and people of color and we want to acknowledge you know myself being a privileged white guy I <laughs> would not be where I am right now without the uh, privileges that were uh, provided to me I'm sure uh, had I not been born white there would have been a lot more obstacles in my way to get where I am right now. And um, I'm very, very fortunate to be able to do the job that I'm doing and communicate with all of you. And I think that's something that we can all do is just acknowledge the uh, lack of barriers that we've had to put us in the places we are. And that often our gripes are pretty trivial compared to the strifes and struggles of other people and be willing to admit where you've made mistakes and be open to educating yourself and doing what you can to better the world and and provide people of color with more opportunity. Um, Yeah, I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Asaf. Yeah, I just think, uh, again, um, first of all, I completely agree with what you said and and, um, we spoke about this uh, before the show. that we want to use this platform to uh, reach out to communities that are maybe, you know, that either don't have access or haven't been able to access uh, this uh, sport because of race related issues. Um, And we definitely want to find ways to address it and welcome them in. And so if anybody that's listening in has a community that they know, that is uh, that is unable to become a part of this conversation. Please, you know, we will be more than happy to include them and, uh, yeah, we and would, share we would our knowledge with them. From from people of all races and backgrounds, and things like that. And there's no greater thing than helping someone who uh, doesn't have an opportunity. Um, yeah. Um, just while we're on the topic, it's kind of interesting because cycling obviously is, is not immune to racism and exclusion of um, people of color and things like that. And that's really been highlighted lately. I, I Specialized put a thing out that they're part of the problem, which I thought was really awesome for a massive company like that to make a, such a bold statement. Um, along with uh, their athletes, Corey Williams. Everybody knows Nation's number one beast, and uh, mm-hmm. we, I follow him. And yeah, was him and his brother, yeah. Yeah, it's super interesting to hear his experiences on his uh, Instagram page, which inspired a lot of trolling, which is a real shame, but it highlights how bad things are. Um, and you also put something pretty cool out, was the uh, link to the cyclingmagazine.ca, and they had just like really brief um, summaries of the exclusion of people of color. I, I, that to me was a huge education and just realizing the limited accessibility to our sport. And I'm not trying to make this about me at all, but just as a something that I've experienced, I came into cycling primarily from a freestyle BMX background. And uh, being a fringe sport, like that, there really aren't a lot of obstacles to entry aside from having a bicycle. And because of that, I think I was exposed to a lot more black athletes. So we used to follow this company called Animal Bikes and uh, they had the most amazing team and they had guys like Edwin De La Rosa, Tyrone Williams and all these guys. And I was exposed to a lot more black culture, black music and things like that, that I wouldn't have been otherwise. Um, And even now as a sidebar, realizing that they had a lot of obstacles to get where they were and they were treated differently than the white athletes. But then just, just coming back to road cycling and where we're at and it's a much, much smaller fraction of black or people of color that we're seeing in our sport. And it's a much, much bigger sport than freestyle BMX. Like 
infinitely more. So yeah, yeah that's crazy to, to, to draw those parallels between something that's a fringe sport versus something that has structured organizations and communities to help build and grow the sport and, and all that versus a sport that's kind of like left to its own devices. And we see less people of um, unfortunate circumstances coming through a sport that has organizations to help get you there. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, no, I think, uh, you know, we want, we're, when we're talking about diversity, it's important that people that have the power actually come together and, and think about ways to um, open the doors and welcome more communities into it. I think it's really important to uh, recognize that there, there are a lot of, uh, um, you know, a lot of genders and race and sex differences in, in the sport. Um, you know, the inequality between men and women, the sport is a huge thing as well. You know, we are seeing a rise in women's uh, cycling, but but I personally want to see a lot more. And that's something that Dark Horse is, is, that's one of our biggest agendas. You know, we really want to see more equality in the sport. Um, and same thing goes for uh, for race. I think there's, there should not be any um, any difference between uh, the access to the sport uh, between uh, black, Asian, you know, white, nothing. It, it's it shouldn't be it shouldn't be that way. But the the question really is, um, what can we do uh, to make that difference? And that's where I think this discussion should go um, with the current events you know this time i mean right now everything is is very uh heated and uh, you yeah, see the emotions emotions, emotions yeah. are high just like you were saying. emotions are high uh things are maybe a little bit crazy and in many cases i think they're starting to steer towards the wrong direction that's slightly counterproductive in my opinion um i think it's important that we recognize our emotions but I think it's important our actions are being led by logic and with that we find, sit down, have a real discussion about what actions must be made to have diversity as a core element in our sport. Um, it's, it's, yeah, I think that's really, really important. So hopefully um, in the near future, we will see this discussion opening up more um and that we actually find ways to to address this issue as much as we can it's yeah. i find I think, it as um, an imperative topic i think um uh, just we'll, we'll kind of wrap up shortly on, on this topic and uh, maybe open it up at another stage but just to kind of wrap things up there is is just to keep things positive there are definitely things that you can do without being negative or 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 being super political. I know that some people don't want to take a stance, um, but there's lots of things that you can do as, <laughs> as a white dude who's part of the problem. Uh, educate yourself, read stuff, um, follow people of color, follow black athletes. Um, a lot of athletes like Corey Williams, Tyrone Williams, the, the Williams brothers. Um, we have uh, Josh Tyrell here in Vancouver, who's a, uh, sponsored by a state bicycle company. He's, I, I've got a great story about him. He's, he's, he's a sick dude, but athletes like that, you know, they need exposure and their sponsors um, reward them based on content and followers and things like that. So if you can follow more black athletes, you'll learn more. They get more from it. Um, use, your, use your dollars. Uh, the biggest impact you can make is changing the way the economy swings. Like uh, what's the, what's the guy from Amazon's name? Jeff, Jeff Bezos. He doesn't need yeah. any more of your dollars, right? So look up black companies. <laughs> he doesn't need another yacht. Um, look up black companies and spend your money that way. Like uh, we have a lot of black personal trainers in Vancouver. Um, I'll list some off. So I just did a little bit of research myself. Some of you can go to check out, um, local businesses of color is afrobiz.ca. Um, I found a nutritionist called Sadie Tomasos. Um, I'll put her Instagram link in there. She's a holistic nutritionist, but she's focused on um, healing through nutrition, which I thought was awesome. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty keen to try some of her recipes. They look amazing. Uh, 
Tori Katango movement. Uh, she works at Soul Cycle, um, so she's a Soul Cycle instructor. If you want to get some uh, spin classes going, that's a great way to support. Um, and cool. out in Burnaby, Diet Fitness Inc. is run by Johnny Daniel. He's the owner and a CrossFit coach. Um, Cooler Kitchen uh, is Afro Vegan Food. So our boy uh, Jay Gunzik, you got to hit them up for sure. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and we would love to hear from you. If you guys have any suggestions, yeah. especially we want to hear about cycling-based businesses or coaching and shine a, shine a light on them. I mean, we're not yeah. a huge social media outlet. We don't have thousands of followers, but if we can even educate a handful of people and, and, and expose uh, each other to, to more people of color, that would be great. Yeah, so, and I, yeah. Will, I will also just add, you know, uh, again, without – being too political, I think we need to broaden it up to marginalized groups. So if you're Absolutely. in your community, if you if you're aware of communities that are being marginalized, um, I think it's really important that we help them elevate and you know help them or elevate them. I think it's really important that as a whole you make your whole community stronger, and our sport will be much more resilient and stronger if we actually recognize that we have these groups and that we try to incorporate and elevate them as much as we can. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, let's, let's move on before we get too heavy here. So sure. um, today we kind of wanted to chat about a few different things. Asaf mentioned uh, he wanted to talk about coasting. So I'm super interested to hear what you have to say about that. And that leads Great. on from this discussion we were having about zone one training so we're going to touch on that too and we also want to define some terms so you guys are on the same page as we are so um most of us understand the concept of ftp functional threshold power it's been probably the most popular measurement of uh, baseline fitness for the last i don't know two decades or something and it's been pushed in front of us um predominantly through social media and cycling blocks, it's still valid. Um, another term that you might not be familiar with is called critical power. Uh, that's very similar. And that's actually something that you um, exposed me to Asaf. How, how is critical power the same or different to FTP? Yes, yeah, so um, should we start with the coasting or should we dive into, I think Let's you know what- This and then we'll- Yes, then we'll go into I agree. Just so when we start to talk more about that, I think everyone understanding the terms that we're referring to will be pretty important. Sounds good. So FTP and critical power are, um, even though they, they measure the outcome uh, from an external metric, meaning that they, they re you calculate your threshold based on the power production. It's not based on what's happening inside the body. It's only based on how fast you're going, how, how many watts you're pushing, you know, how much power you're producing. Um, they are similar in that sense, but they go at it from very different directions. Um, so if you want to think about what a functional threshold power is, if to those who are unfamiliar, they can Google uh, an FTP test and you'll get many, many, many results on what it is and how to do it and, and stuff like that. Uh, but essentially, um, a functional threshold power refers to uh, the amount of power you can sustain for one hour when you go full gas. That's, that's basically what it's trying to capture. And the old school test was like a one hour maximal test right yeah like I, yeah. I i cannot imagine doing that like i've i've yeah. never done it i don't <laughs> i don't think i want to do it i think 40 yeah. minutes is the most i've really like pushed my <laughs> that, well, that was like i'm good that's right i'm good for that's, the next eight weeks absolutely it's it's a horrible test i mean really it's it's just uh there's a youtube uh video of a guy who is asking can i actually ride at my estimated ftp for one hour yeah and it's uh it's very difficult so uh that kind of shows the the limitation of that measurement so okay. uh, functional threshold power usually isn't being measured in one hour what you do is you measure it in 20 minutes mm -hmm. with a usually there's a five minute effort that precedes the 20 minute effort um 
And I'm not going to go into the details, but essentially from the 20 minute effort, whatever you end up having as the average power, you multiply that by 0.95 and that will give you your estimated functional threshold yeah. power. And the reason is you basically want to extrapolate it to one hour, so you do the, the, that uh, multiplication. Yeah, I, I still use that test with a lot of my athletes. Um, even though it might not be the, the best testing out there, I think if you can justify your means, that's, that's how you can validate a test like that. And for a lot of our athletes, their goals involve climbing up mountains and doing mm -hmm. events and things like that. So for me, I get a lot more information than just what they can do for a 20 minute max or extrapolating that to their FTP number. I think the 20 minute, the classic 20 minute test, um, a is doable by most, most athletes standards. Like anyone can do 20 minutes of maximal power as un uncomfortable as it gets. But for me, I can also see an athlete's motivation. Like at what point their mental game starts to suffer. And when I start yeah. to see a new yeah. athlete, I can yeah. see their breaking point very early or their pacing strategy. So That's a right. lot of athletes going through, so I didn't mean to interrupt you, but uh, going through like trainer road or Zwift, I see them doing eight minute tests and ramp tests and they get much better results than their FTP, but that's not really what a test is about to me. It's yeah. about finding your, your physiological and even your mental limiters and then working on those. Uh, yeah. yeah. So let's, let's, yeah. let's actually uh, unravel some of the stuff that you've uh, touched upon. So um, it's important to recognize that, first of all, a test is only as good as the parameters that you're inserting into it, right? So the, right. the, the numbers, the data that you're plugging in, uh, that's what makes the test uh, good or bad. Um, as far as uh, whether or not the test is valid, that depends on what it's coming to assess, what it's coming to measure now. Now, the thing about the FTP test, the way I look at it uh, versus something like a laboratory uh, assessment or even something that uh, is more encompassing. FTP is essentially a score on a test. Okay, so you go, you do, the test has a hundred questions. Each question is looking at a different uh, system in your body. The functional threshold power is one test and it gives you just a grade. That's it. So yeah. it's not telling you what you got right or wrong in the test. It's just giving you a grade. Yeah. So that's, that's okay. Like that's important. Obviously you want to see if you're improving or not based on that grade, right? So mm -hmm. if right now you get a result and for you, that's your first time and that's your baseline. The next time you do it, you probably want to see that you're improving. So you want to get a high, to reach a higher number. And that's yeah. good. That's, that's a valid uh, performance uh, assessment. The thing is um, what it's measuring is, is, the relevancy of that measurement uh, in many cases is amplified way beyond what it's actually coming to show. So uh, for example, there is a software called Training Peaks. Okay. And Training Peaks is a very popular software both for coaches and athletes. And it has something known as a training stress score. Yeah. Now a training stress score is something that is essentially telling you how much time you spend above or below your FTP and for how long, right? Um, now, that assumption that FTP is the point of reference is flawed yeah. because, because the FTP itself is only indicative of how hard you can push for 20 minutes and then extrapolate it to one hour. That's yeah. it. Yeah. So if you're a sprinter, for example, um, then obviously your FTP of 20 minutes isn't representative of your true capabilities. It is representative of how hard you can go for 20 minutes, but it doesn't say if you're a good or bad rider, right? Same thing goes for someone who only, who does really well in ultra endurance events. Um, you know, these individuals can ride maybe not super fast for one hour, but they can ride relatively fast for 10 hours. Yeah. So what I'm saying is, uh, the FTP test is a good example of how we should treat our uh, performance assessments. We always have to look at each individual data point with the respect that it has, but not over expand it to other areas. 
So critical power, for example, does a slightly better job than functional threshold power because it takes more um, numbers into consideration. Yeah. Um, and this goes way back. Uh, so the history of, of the critical power number or model dates back to 1914. Um, oh. Yeah, so, um, uh, so a researcher named A.V. Hill, who's one yeah. of the fathers of you know, performance uh, physiology and, and uh, even beyond that. Um, well, you're the father of human physiology, but I guess I'm wrong. Is one yeah well there were people before him but uh, but anyway he's a very important figure in our in our uh, um, in the science of human physiology and what he did was he essentially plotted the best performances from world uh, class athletes from I think their Olympic results or or top results at world in the world championships and he plotted um, the results from different distances both for running and for swimming and what he saw was that for different distances the times that were obtained uh, when you plot them on a graph they don't have a linear relationship so it's not like for 200 meters 300 meters yeah. 400 meters 500 meters you have this linear relationship for time no you have a curvilinear relationship now the thing about that is at some point you see that that curve just flattens out and uh, that plateau is what we refer to as critical power. So there's a, what it represents physiologically um, is how hard one can go uh, while maintaining homeostasis, while maintaining a balance of, in, of energy in and energy out. Um, and so for us, that's kind of your aerobic capacity, aerobic how hard you can go when you're relying primarily on aerobic metabolism. I'm not going to, I'll try to be, you know, I won't go too deep into the weeds here, but just mm -hmm. so that people will understand critical power is essentially telling you that if you stay at that number or below, you can last for quite a long time. Yeah. Okay. And if you go above, it becomes exponentially harder and the time you can stay above critical power becomes smaller and smaller very, very quickly. Yeah. So, um, and it's all based on the same idea. You go hard for one minute, two minutes, three minutes, anywhere to about 15 minutes, and then you can plot that curve and whatever you end up as an asymptote is that flat line, that's your critical power. Right. So compared to FTP, that one is just taking more dots, more data points along your performance chart, and therefore it's more representative of what you can actually do. Yeah. Okay. That's why personally I prefer to use it when I look at just power date, power uh, numbers, right. um, and when I don't ha have access to the individual. Right. Now, um, what I prefer as a coach to use, and this is something that I think is very important to to point out because um, the numbers are very important. But like you said, in an FTP test for you as a coach, you don't necessarily just want to look at the, at the final outcome and the number, but you want to look at pacing strategies. You want to see the break, mental breakpoints. You want to see the pacing strategies. You want to see how the individual actually, actually is able to withstand the intensity and the effort that he's, being, that he's undertaking or she's undertaking. And so for me, looking at someone's rate of perceived exertion, seeing how they're coping with the effort is far more important than any number. It doesn't mean that the numbers are important. They can be used as a reference point, again, to see improvement. But when I coach someone, I want them to look at them as secondary reference point. The primary yeah. reference point should always be, how do I feel when I push this hard, right? So, the reason for that, both from a mental and a physiological standpoint, is there are very important things that we work on uh, and we improve when we are able to listen to what our body is telling us. Yeah. And that brings us to zone one, okay? Right. So zone one training, um, or <laughs> zone one is coming from the model that we've discussed last time that was created by Steven Seiler. Um, he put everything together. So, you know, I can't give him all the credit, but he put things together. And essentially the human body 
when you try to isolate the different zones, we're looking at primarily three zones, right? We have um, a zone where the supply and demand of oxygen, which is our primary source of fuel, um, is uh, higher on the supply and very low on the demand. So when we go easy, we have high oxygen that's coming in, high amount of oxygen, and we don't need to use all of it. So a lot of it just kind of comes in and then goes out. We don't, the muscles don't require it that much. Then we have zone two. Zone two is more of the tempo, sweet spot, all the stuff that we like to, the terms that we like to use. And that's where oxygen supply and demand is being met. And then uh, the zone three is where uh, supply cannot meet the demand. So that's beyond your anaerobic threshold, that's beyond your FTP, critical power, whatever you want to use. Now, um, there could be another domain, you know, some might argue that there's a fourth domain, which is uh, the severe extreme intensity domain, that that's like really short efforts, sprints, stuff like that. Like very anaerobic, like less than a minute type efforts? Oh, less than 10 seconds. Like, less than 10 like, seconds, right. Yeah, like super, super high uh, intensity. Um, and as far as the sensation, what you want to feel is how do I feel when I go right at those thresholds or a little bit above or a little bit below. That's more important than trying to fixate on a certain number. Yeah. And the reason for that is that those numbers vary from day to day. Um, there's a great video that people should watch um, on GCN uh, that was posted by Jeremy Powers. Yeah, he did something... Okay. He FTP did something test nuts. Every day? Yes, FTP <laughs> test every day. It's, yeah, it's, it's nuts. I like, oh. Honestly, I saw that. I was like, man, I should totally get my athletes to do that. <laughs> but they're probably listening and don't, no, no, don't do that. Don't do yeah. that. <laughs> but everyone but is the running thing, to the hills right now. Like, I know, I know. I yeah, yeah, yeah. Ass call, like, yes, this guy's right. crazy. Sure. No, but I think the concept is interesting because it just shows um, the variability between day to day. Right, so yeah, there, um, there was like one day where he was like forty watts higher than any other day. That was crazy, yeah, yeah, yeah. Considering yeah. it was like a consecutive day thing, and right. I think he was using heart rate variability to measure his recovery. Yeah, and he yeah. just had much better recovery than the days before. Yeah, and there's many factors that go into that, right? But if I were his coach. I would really be curious at what the hell did you do that day? Like, that's what I want to know, right? Yeah. So it's not about the performance on that day. It's not about that number. It's how you got to it. Yeah. So that's the whole point. Like, what did you feel? What was going on? Uh, what were the, the whole package that brought you to that point? You want to decouple everything. That's, that's the whole point of coaching. What are all the variables leading up to that moment? From right, right. And even during the effort, like, what did you do? Or what did you notice that was different? The sensations that he's describing, I found them to be very, very important because the ability to recognize um, what his body was telling him at that given uh, test uh, versus all the other tests, is that's the crucial information because you want to be able to replicate that, right? Um, so that's kind of, that kind of shows the weight that you have to put on the way that you feel versus the what power you can put out okay so the numbers are important but how you feel when you produce those uh numbers is more important um so when we talk about zone one for example and then we can go into the coasting aspect right so how do you actually ride at zone one uh or below zone one where we like we said it's a very easy ride a lot of times many athletes come to me and like you said it's a leap of faith for them and they say wow this is too light like yeah. I, I can't go this slowly like nothing's gonna change you know i i, I this is this is a little ridiculous I, I find with athletes who are going through zone one we're constantly fighting um and i think being a personal trainer that it's coming from the fitness arena primarily like well it is now being fueled primarily from that like crossfit bodybuilding etc etc mm -hmm. so the no pain no gain type training method Correct. And it just, it isn't better. It works. No. I'm not saying it doesn't work. And I'm not trying to throw anyone under the bus. If you like to fucking crush yourself, that's awesome. Go yeah. for it. If that's, if that's how you get your shits and giggles, sorry for the cursing, but yeah, that, that's totally, you should get what you want out of your training, but it's not the only way. And for those of us who have 
families and work lives to get back to and we have to have a certain amount of energy, hmm. there are other ways and they might be more efficient and better. Sorry. Yeah. That. So on that point, um, you know, a lot of times people underestimate the cost of zone one training because it doesn't feel hard. Yeah. And, First and of all, just because, yeah. You were also saying training peaks scoring system based off of TSS. And this is something I wanted mm -hmm. to touch on really quickly while you hit that. It doesn't give a fair representation of zone one, I find. Like That's if right. you're doing five hour ride at zone one, and yeah, at the time you, you might even feel good in the fifth hour, but that night you have the deepest sleep you've ever had and you feel drained. Mm. So, wow. That was like doing VO2 workout in some ways, but training stress score on, on training peaks might only give you 130 points. Whereas I can go and do hill repeats on the pitch and putt and do 30, 40 second maxes and do six to eight of those and get 120 points in less than an hour. So which, which day is more valuable to me? I guess it really comes down to what my goals are, but True. how can I get one score that's almost the same as the other for something that's a five hour effort versus something else? So it's an unfair scoring system to base it all off of FTP. Correct. Um, and you know, so let's, let's look into that for a second. Um, and then I'll ask you, uh, what's it like to ride 300 kilometers? Uh, <laughs> and, uh, that, that would be a good example. Uh, just want to give a shout out to the person who asked us on that, but, uh, yeah. I'll try to find the post. But anyway, awesome? yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, he so was shout out to him. Okay. okay. So shout out to him on, uh, he was your writing buddy. Yeah, shout out to Ryan. That's yeah, it. he, he kind of... So he's as crazy as you are. He's doing good until the eighth hour. So, yeah. So, that's you, so that's exactly the point, right? So, um, first of all, it, what people need to recognize is that zone one may seem easy because it's easier compared to the other zones, but it's not easy. You know, uh, think about the fact that it, a person's average, you know, kind of a general uh, resting heart rate is around 60 beats per minute, right? Your zone one is more than double that. So um, you're still putting a lot of stress on the system. It's not like nothing's happening, right? So for maybe uh, a three hour ride, you don't necessarily feel that hard when you're going at 120, 130 beats per minute. If your zone one is, let's say 140, but trust me, uh, you don't have to trust me. You can just see the, you know, the, the evidence. There's a lot of stress that's happening when you're pushing your heart rate double the speed, um, then it, it works at rest. So just because it can't do it doesn't mean it's easy for it. So the adaptations that we have, the stress that we're putting on our body is, is real. It's, it's high. It's just not, doesn't feel that hard because we're well adapted to work at that uh, rev range. But if you wanna get big gains, um, and boost your aerobic system, you don't necessarily need to punish your body every single day, yeah. you know, because you're destroying parts of the system that way, which is fine. That's another part of the process, but to do it over and over again, the cost is immensely high. So the beauty of the aerobic zone, the beauty of the oxygenation zone, where you have more oxygen coming in than you're being used, is that you give the body the ideal um, environment to grow. And in endurance sports, it's all about how much you can endure, both from an intensity side, but primarily from how long you can last. Yeah. So I think, I think a lot of times the way that people have it constructed, uh, uh, especially because of the tendency to focus on numbers like FTP and stuff like that, is how many punches I can throw. Yeah. Right? So if you go into a ring, you have 12 rounds. When can I get my knockout? And people try to get it in the first round. but you, if you can't get it in in the first round, sometimes you have to last the whole 12. If you can't do that, don't step into the ring. Yeah. So that's the whole point. We are endurance athletes. We need to take care of our body to last and not just being able to throw that, that punch, unless you're a track racer, or BMX rider, or something like that, right? But well, that's a different another, another good example is uh, your, your road racer guy who or a girl who come up to you and they say, 
uh, I'm, I'm a natural sprinter. So, you know, the zone one training isn't really going to work for me. So, right. well, you still have to get through four hour day to launch your sprint. And if your zone one is low and you're competing with the resources that you need for your sprinting, how good is that sprint going to be at the end of the day? Are you even going to finish with the pack? What if the pack starts to pick up their speed, right? And exactly. that steps you out of your, your natural zone one. Well, exactly. there, goes, there goes your race when you sprint. You might just be using that up just to hold on, right? So, Exactly. So let me just leave uh, people with a tip before I start uh, yeah. uh, interrogating you about your insane 300 kilometer ride because i'm i am curious i've never done anything like that um so if people can't get access to a laboratory and they really want to figure out where their zone one is uh, there's a very simple way to 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 uh to do that it's essentially there's a thing uh it sounds simple but trust me it it makes a lot of sense it's called a talk test and the talk, talk test, test what it is talk yeah okay. whether you can talk Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah. So, um, if you're out on a ride, on a group ride, for example, or just on your, by yourself, uh, which may seem weird because you just talk to yourself, but try singing, right? Um, if you're going at a pace that you can't hold a conversation without without uh, having to catch your breath and stuff like that, like just a normal, like we're chatting now, you're going too hard. That's pretty much it. So if your ventilation has to battle uh, both talking and keeping the pace up, you're going too hard. Yeah. Okay, so that's an easy way to understand where your zone one is. Now, the thing about zone one rides is that there's an argument between should I go with zone one power versus zone one heart rate. And uh, zone one, and there's a big difference there. First of all, both heart rate and power change during a ride. So if you're tired, you're, let's say even FTP or zone one power over the ride won't be the same at the start of the ride and after five hours or I don't know, 12, whatever it is you did, right? So it's, uh, it feels very different. And um, if you try to hold a specific power output, you're gonna fail, okay? You're gonna overtax the system far beyond what, what uh, the goal of the workout is. Heart rate, um, there's a thing called uh, cardiac drift. So as you get tired, um, your, your heart will basically try to assist by pushing more blood more frequently. So um, you'll see a drift, your heart rate will drift up. So if you're trying to hold a certain power, I'm sorry, a certain heart rate number, uh, you'll have to kind of chase that a little bit. So yeah, yeah. Um, I, I the, find that happens to a lot of athletes and they, they, they use the same terminology. They're like, Oh, my heart rate got really sensitive. Right. And they're like, yeah. oh, it kept bumping up really quickly and, and things like that. It was, it was much more sensitive at this point in the ride. So that's probably where they're experiencing that. Right. Yeah. So um, again, the feel is what matters. So um and we can touch upon we can touch upon this in other episodes where we discuss the feel that you should have when you're at the limit, right? Uh, or when you're going full gas or in a time trial or stuff like that. And I have great examples that are fresh in my head because yesterday I took two elite guys for a 20k time trial. Um, <laughs> tried to work on pacing strategies that are more related to what they feel and what their muscles are actually doing in a very unique, using a very nice technology um, versus using heart rate or power. So it's fascinating. And being able to see that is just, I love it. Like that's, yeah. that's what I, this is why I do it. Um, I think we should chat so about that next week because that was a pretty interesting ride. So yeah. amazing, right? Yeah. I'll show the data if, if uh, I'll get, I'll get a, permission from them if they if they want to i hope that and uh, i'll share it with individuals i won't mention names but i'll just show what the data looks like i think it's really fascinating um but essentially uh, again it's all about the feel so whether it's a zone one ride or whether it's a heart ride you want to listen to your body and see what it's telling you instead of just trying to stick to a certain number so that will give you much bigger gains over time than maybe just one workout where you push yourself to a maximum and you're like i'm done now, I'm actually, I think we've, we've covered that topic quite well. Yeah. Um, 
and hopefully if people still have questions about zone yeah. one how can they apply and stuff like that please feel free to uh plug that I, in i think the comments. it's important just to clarify for everyone out there that when we refer most of the time asaf and i will be referring to zone one heart rate but we literally test that number individually so we go to lab and we do a uh, blood lactate test or a oxygen saturation test to distinguish that number and it's unique to everyone rather than using either an FTP test to predict zone one or a functional threshold heart rate test to predict zone one. We're actually testing that number exclusively. So you could have an FTP number that's test for a zone one heart rate that's tested for and usually that test will also give you your your zone two that's your that's your anaerobic threshold right so zone then, two yeah yeah exactly yeah so you get you, when you do a test with us you get kind of two numbers um uh, you have a few different tests right. Let, let's let's chat about that next time and, and um, yeah. we'll just wrap up this and everyone kind of knows what we're talking about when we talk about ftp critical power and heart rate zone one. So yes. there's a lot of different. <laughs> now, heart, exactly. Just before we go, I, I'm I'm confused. Is aerobic capacity and heart rate zone one kind of talking about the same thing? Uh, no. Um, so we can go into that. That's slightly a slightly bigger topic. Uh, but um, we'll stick with just heart rate zone one for yeah, now. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Actually, yeah. Uh, I I would like to segue into a slightly different topic. Uh, that's, you know, we're giving individuals tools that they should have very early on, right? This talk test is very simple. Everybody should use it. Yeah. Um, having a, a bit of an understanding of what, you should, what it should feel like and stuff like that, I think that's really important for people to make the most out of their training. Yeah. Um, you've, wrote, you've written, uh, to those who don't know, you've had, I think on this past weekend, a ride that was 300 kilometers long. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, so that's that's a crazy number, um, and it's amazing how on social media um, there's a a pro tour. Uh, the U.S. champion did a 344 kilometer ride uh, from Colorado to Kansas, uh, and I think everybody it just seemed like it was an impossible thing. And you went out and did it, and then uh, two of my other guys. They've already done two of those this past month. So it's like, yeah. I guess it's not that big of a deal. Um, but I want to ask you, and this is something that we could probably uh, talk about more in the future, but if somebody's listening into this and they're just, they're not, they're new to the sport, or they're just thinking about coming into the sport, you know, before they jump in and start to aim for a 300 kilometer ride, <laughs> you know, it's like, don't jump into it if you can. No, no, <laughs> you know, but I want you to kind of uh, give us an intro into, I mean, you're so experienced with novice riders, right? What it takes to come into the sport. What are the first important steps that people have to do to avoid the mistakes that will get them to come to the sport and then leave after six months, right? Yeah, Maybe yeah. what not to listen to and stuff like that, so few points um for for an amateur athlete getting into it um the, the most important thing is finding out what you enjoy about cycling like what, what really motivates you to get out on the out, out on your bike is it like riding with your buddies is it uh riding a fisherman trail on your gravel bike uh exploring for all my athletes elite or amateur I always try to incorporate a sense of adventure in their riding because it's not really about the result. It's like, you're going to do most of my athletes are training for the Whistler Graham Fondo or something similar to that. So my, my specialty is kind of Fondo riders. So that's the ultimate goal, but they start in March. They've got weeks and weeks and weeks of training to get there. So, and motivation can, dwindle pretty quickly if things are boring all the time or it's just too structured so mm. i know what's going to get in there in the best shape and that's what they say they want but i also know you got to keep motivation high so incorporating the uh, adventure component keeps them kind of more engaged um, and sometimes fueling their ego a little bit so sometimes it is chasing down strava segments and kom's mm -hmm. yeah maybe it's not that productive for your fitness but 
once a month, I can incorporate um, something that they're going to enjoy and get something that I want to get out of it, like a five minute test. I want to see what someone's five minute power is. So we go out and find one of their favorite uh, steep climbs and we know that they're going to be doing it in over five minutes. So now we can do a five minute test there. So and so, I want you to go out and set a Strava PR on the Westport climb or whatever it is, right? They get something from it. I get good information to help me with my coaching, make sure that they're not um, stretching themselves too thin when we do VO2 work or something like that. Um, and that helps keep them engaged. So, really, the training is more as for other coaches out there, make the training part of the journey. Mm. Like it's the storyline leading up to the um the the punchline right so make the story a good one because yeah. the race might not go in their favor because it's canceled many, yeah or get canceled there's too many things along the way that are going to determine whether they get their their results or not that may have nothing to do with their fitness they could be in the best shape of their life and still fail to meet it and get a puncture or someone crashes into them like last was a few of my athletes were interfered with um thankfully no one was hurt only one really crashed but everyone's times were disrupted by the big crashes in the list of grand fondo but they all came back the next year because they loved the training they loved the journey it was about the storyline that we've written for them and that's really how you should uh try to approach things for me that came from my bmx background so being on a fringe sport not having any guidelines or training um, you had to be self-motivated. You had to be creative and use your imagination, right? So literally going up and down alleyways to find fun things to ride that looked like skate parks. And at the time we were getting kicked out of skate parks by skateboarders because they hated us. And certain skate parks had no bikes rule because there's a misconception that bikes would damage um, skate park property, which is complete nonsense. But so we just had to find alternatives. And that exploratory nature just carried through into my road biking and then into my coaching. So sending mm. a client uh, a route that they've never done before can be the most freeing experience for them. Each time they get fitter and fitter, and that's how my 300 kilometer ride came about, you get to explore more. Yeah. That's really what your fitness should be about. It's just not about this number. It's not about this FTP thing, because that can change and that can go away. But I can't take away that experience of like sending somebody out to Chilliwack for the first time, like, and, and seeing new roads and, and finding that's another thing that BMX gave me is like finding how road flows. There's no, there's no better feeling than having an uninterrupted road that has trees and forests around you sweeping bank corners and just like, having confidence in your speed and then hitting a punchy climb on the other side and knowing that you have the fitness to just hammer the top of it. Mm. None of that really has anything to do with training, but it's important to, to have in there for myself and clients. So. Right. I think that's, that's, well, <laughs> that's, uh, that's excellent. I honestly, the, the amount of times that I, I went to races in different places around the world and leaving those places thinking wow i didn't really see anything <laughs> you know i i think that's such a shame a lot of us actually focus too much on what we're trying to get out of the ride than actually enjoying it i think uh yeah you've touched upon really the essence of what riding is and what it should be maybe not for everybody some people have to have a carrot uh in front of them you know to to chase but um you have to be able to step out of the whole you know, kind of training and narrow-minded focus and being able to look around and see what's, what's happening around you. And in many cases, actually use that fitness to extend your explorations, right? So I think, yeah. You, you, can, you can hit multiple goals, right? Like that's the beauty of zone one training is the better I get at it, the further I can go. And I get to explore mm. new places. So that really was what this one was about. I'd wanted to do a 300-kilometer ride for a long time. And um, I kind of been working up to it doing like five hours on one, six hours on one. And then eventually I did a couple seven hours. I did a, a 200, interestingly enough, I did a 200 kilometer ride from my house um, probably two months ago. And I didn't really enjoy that much at all. 
But this 300 kilometer ride was amazing. It was super fun in spite of all the weather conditions and everything we're fighting. Like it was 11 degrees and all I had was Jersey bibs and uh, a wind vest. And uh, I loved every minute of it because I was experiencing something new, uh, riding with someone new and just, yeah, it was it, all those things just added to the excitement. It just, it was horrible at times, but it accentuated the experience overall. So yeah, it was, it was a real adventure. I love it. And that, that definitely makes you want to get on your bike and ride. So oh, okay. thanks for that. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. The, the only thing that I want to just add in there was, um, is thanks to you and zone one training, but also I've been taking the time to read a lot of nutrition blogs and, uh, who's the guy He's the coach for Lotto NL Yumbo. And, uh, uh yes. Uh, Juke and Droop. Yeah. And yeah. I, he's got his own website and he talks about like carbohydrate intake and all that. And, and I listened to a few podcasts as well with him and he's like, yeah, I usually start training my athletes how to ingest carbohydrates per hour about 10 weeks out from their event. So that wasn't really how I planned my 300 kilometer ride, but over the last like 12 weeks, I've gradually been increasing my carbohydrate intake. So I went from like just barely managing to get 60 grams of carbohydrates in per hour and now I can consume about 90 grams of carbohydrates per hour. And I just stuck to a, a game plan. That's where my riding partner fell off a little bit. Um, Ryan was doing great until the eighth hour, and then he got a little nauseous. His body wasn't processing the bars. I think he had just maybe front-loaded his solid food intake, and mm -hmm. nothing was going through anymore. So when he was having nutrition, he was feeling nauseous, so he couldn't take on any more nutrition but is obviously depleting his stores the further, further down the road we got. Whereas I felt just as good in the ninth hour <laughs> as I did in the second and third hour. The only difference was yeah. my hamstrings were a little bit more sensitive. And I, mm -hmm. I attribute that not only to the zone one conditioning that I did, but to training my body to handle that. And I just had a, I had a nutrition plan that I stuck to like every single hour. It was one bar and a half a package of shot blocks. That was mm -hmm. 60 grams of carbohydrates and there was about 30 or 40 grams of carbohydrates in each bottle that I had. So I had a bottle of uh, Bourne sports mix um, and I would I'd drink one of those large bottles every hour and a half. And then towards the end of the ride, I, I transitioned more to gels because I knew I wasn't going to be processing any more solids or, or yes. for me, it was hard. So yeah, and I just stuck to that plan religiously and it worked. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's another aspect that we'll touch upon in the future. I think, First of all, just so if people are curious um, who the individual is that we spoke about, his name is Askar uh, Jukindrup, or uh, I probably completely um, uh, mispronounced his name. Uh, he's, uh, he's a Dutch uh, researcher from, uh, I think it's from the Maastricht University. Maybe he's not there right now, but anyway, um, uh, funny enough, he was born in the uh, city where we, I spent most of my uh, at time as a junior riding and racing so anyway um uh go check him out google him uh, maybe we'll put his name up in the comments uh and uh, the nice thing about that is you can really hear how you prepared yourself what were some of the key aspects that worked for you that you tried to to find what works for you what doesn't work for you how you came up to this yeah ability to ride this amount of volume um trying different things and trying to play with your diet and nutrition and adopting something new and i think that that's another another big topic is really uh how do i find what works best for me right um so we're here talking about coaching methodologies and, and training and, and motivation and stuff like that and people have to kind of try and listen to all that and then go home and think or stay at home and think about <laughs> uh what works for them yeah. so i think it, nutrition especially if there's anything that's coming out of recent research is, is the amount of individual variability that exists in the science and how other people or different people have different things that work for them um so it's not a you know a one recipe that fits everyone um type thing I think that's that's extremely important to just highlight right off the get right from the start, um, and we can definitely dive more into the different things and the different 
uh, types of nutrition and different uh, supplements or stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. But as a whole, I would highly recommend to anybody who's listening to this to bear in mind that whatever we discuss here, self-experimentation is still uh, warranted. You have to be able to uh, find the pieces that work best for you and then the process of how to put the pieces together that takes yeah. time. It just takes time. A coach can really help you with that, yeah. at least to shorten that process quite a bit to give you as much information as possible. Um, uh, but at the end of the like, day, self-experimentation. A lot of people don't realize, like when you look at that ride, you're like, oh, you just went out and did a 300 kilometer ride. I didn't just go out and do it. Like there was a lot of meticulous planning that went into it and, and a lot of training that led up to it right down to figuring out what brand of bars I wanted to have with me. In fact, I got one of them wrong. Um, I didn't enjoy some of the things that I, I had on that ride, which is fine. But like leading up to that, I tried Lyra bars. I tried this and that. I tried Scratch and, and all this. So I, I went with products that I knew I liked because in that scenario, maybe that wasn't the best race food, performance food. But just having something that I like, this is something I learned from Michael Wagner from Born. He's so funny. He doesn't even advocate for his own product sometimes. He's like, no, no, you bring something you like with you. If that's an angel food cake, you put that in your pocket. I don't care. Like if you have food on your brain, you're more likely to, to eat. So I, I, I played around and compromised. I wanted something that was going to be performance based. I tried different brands until I found something that a had a high and this is something that I always think about the volume of food that I take with me. So if it's a, a bar, whatever size it is, I want to see how many grams of carbohydrates I can get into that. Right. Mm. And that's a problem when you start looking at uh, eating real foods. I know we're starting to tr trickle down into nutrition here, which we said we weren't going to do, but no, it's okay. Yeah. But like real foods, like, yes, it's awesome. You, you have a banana, but a banana is a massive piece of, food and you have this useless skin that you're going to throw away afterwards and a big banana is maybe 30 grams of carbohydrates whereas that tiny little bar that i had a scratch bar was almost 40 grams of carbohydrates and i could pack my pockets full it's like 10 10 of those bars in my pockets weren't really even bulging so mm -hmm. that was 10 hours of food right there and that's something else i thought about ahead of time is like okay what was our pace going to be what was the wind direction going to be where we going to be suffering a headwind on the way out which we did Okay. Um, we were aiming for about a 30 kilometer average speed and we would only know whether we're going to hold that once we started, but that's how we planned it initially. And then, so we knew that initially we want to do 320, but we ended up with 300. So I knew that I had, I had to have about 12 hours worth of food on me. So I had to plan that ahead of time, figure out, okay, how many bars is that? How many shop blocks is that? And then right down to opening every piece of food that I had with me ahead of time, aside from my gels for obvious reasons, so that when we were going, I wouldn't have to stop to get my food. It was already open. It was already kind of cut into bite-sized pieces so I could eat every 20 minutes and go. The only thing I struggled with was putting my garbage away afterwards because my hands were really cold. Mm -hmm. um, so, so a lot of thought process went into it before and it just kind of worked out perfectly when we started the ride. So it wasn't just like, I was calculating how am I going to get 90 grams in per hour and how am I going to carry that with me? I had a bar bag. Funny story though, if you guys are carrying shop blocks um, and it gets rainy out, make sure you keep them dry because that stuff just turns to uh, sugar and water. <laughs> Right. <laughs> my bar bag was full of water and uh, i was like how did it get full of water well there was rain coming in but it basically melted all my spare shop blocks i had about an extra two or three hours worth of food as emergency food and it was just like this syrup slushing around in my bar bag which probably right. added like oh, who knows like an extra two pounds it's so funny but uh so that that was that was kind of a funny thing that happened along the way. Well, it just sounds like it's easier to digest then. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so it's basically yeah, just, what a gel is, right? There so, you go. Yeah, yeah. Just check it down. Fun. That's yeah. excellent. I well, so if anybody out there is thinking about doing a three hundred kilometer ride, there you go. This is your recipe. Uh, and if you're still unsure, just reach out to Paul. He's gonna guide you through your uh, masochistic uh, ideas. Um, yeah. Wow, Paul, that was excellent.
yeah no, shall we funny. shall we leave off there and leave everybody uh wanting for more hopefully so sure yes each week i keep threatening to make it shorter and we keep going over so <laughs> i don't think short is the you know who, i mean there's no pressure i don't know you got something important you need to do i mean uh did you write today uh i haven't written today but i'm, I'm gonna if the weather uh stays pretty good so i think it's gonna be okay yeah probably be a zone one ride <laughs> awesome <laughs> still recovering i'm sure yeah it's still, still a little bit going on i felt good yesterday i went out with john and and they they tried to thrash me on the mountain bikes and uh oh, cool. uh it didn't go that well for them but no <laughs> it was, it yeah was I, yeah i know i gotta get on that uh, mountain bike ride he's always asking me and i'll i'll make it i know i'll make it you know if you live in vancouver and I haven't been in the mountains yet. Like I've only been on my gravel bike. Um, you gotta go. so Any, anyone I, who's listening, if you haven't been up from, they took me up from and we, we he took me on one of his um, Johnny's amateur climbing routes, and which is basically a series of anaerobic oh, yeah. country hills followed his, by his, like his favorite. Hills. Yeah. And then a nice steady climb to a beautiful viewpoint. Um, and then we came down uh, Bob sled on the way back. It was awesome. It was really fun. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. What, what a way to see the city. And I think that's touching back on what we touched on before is like, that's what cycling should be about. It should expose you to different parts of your city and, and, and show you your city in different ways. That's what cycle totally. was to me. As soon as you're getting bored, change it up, try a different bike. <laughs> Like there's, there's no such thing as boring rides. There's only such thing as boring people. So absolutely, get creative, like there's absolutely. so much out there. Yeah. Big shout out to, uh, big shout out to John Bula and, uh, Grand Fox for, uh, you know, and their Bicicleta, I don't know, shops, organization, whatever you want to call it. It's, yeah. uh, putting people on bikes and making this thing really really interesting yeah and for those um, of you who don't know uh beachy clutter are big supporters of mine and asaf as well and they've really been uh key proponents of our success and uh can't thank them enough for everything they've done and uh i think touching back on the first topic today is your purchasing power really makes a difference so you know covid19 has been stressful for a lot of businesses and staying open and that might not be an issue for those guys, but we always want to see these shops that support communities and individuals sticking around for a long time. So rather than going on to pro bike kit and saving 10 bucks on your new Vittoria open courses, yeah, give that extra 10 bucks to people who really matter because the staff there are real people and your money goes into keeping them in jobs and roofs overheads and things like that. So really, really good time to, to, realize the power of your your money and where it goes and that would be a a fun topic to discuss how we got into the sport both yeah. you and i uh, i definitely had a bike shop that i uh, owe a lot to uh, yeah. with regards to me being in the sport and i'm sure a lot of cyclists out there at any level uh owe a great debt to the to a specific bike shop yeah you know so um Bike, Maybe bike not. People are passionate people, and people like us don't get to where we are without uh, people helping you along the way. And I can think of several bike shops. Another one, just to just to mention, is uh, Ride On. They've always been supporters of mine at the beginning when I was <laughs> a punk ass BMXer. Mm-hmm. And, uh, even now that I'm wearing Lycra, which I'm sure there is is less than ideal for them, they they still you know reach out and support me and send me best wishes. And they're stoked that uh, they were a part of my journey and I'm stoked that they were too. So, you know, yeah. yeah. Well, the, unfortunately the bike shops where I started my whole thing uh, have uh, closed up shop now, uh, but that's just because the owners have retired, which just means how long I've been in this thing. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> I guess, uh, so yeah, shout out to them. Uh, I hope they're enjoying retirement. <laughs> Maybe after supporting me, they were like, oh, man, we can't do this anymore. <laughs> it's like, I'm done. Yeah, not, it's not worth it. So, struggling cyclists, that's not the way. Yes, yeah. you know, it's not yeah. like, yeah. so, I don't know. But anyway, support your uh, local bike shop and local businesses for sure. Um, hopefully, they, they'll keep you happy and we'll keep your community uh, growing. So, there we go.
All right, let's let's wrap it up there. And uh, I think we've got some real food for thought for next week. And uh, anyone who's listening to this, thank you. And everyone who reached out, we got some great messages. Thank you. Uh, we do read those direct messages. So comment, send us stuff. We want to talk about stuff you want to hear about. And if you're enjoying it so far, awesome. Uh, we'll include those links in the bio for the Lotto NL Jumbo coach. Yep, yep, and yep. Uh, yeah. businesses of people of color that you can support um, locally. Yeah, we didn't mention, uh, what we didn't mention is how people can reach out to us. Um, yes. Or at least last time I didn't mention that. Um, so if anybody has any questions they want to refer to me, um, they can go on my website, uh, which I guess it's my website and my, my partners. Um, it's uh, Dark Horse, D-R-K Horse, one word. Uh, dot com and if you want to uh, shoot me a note you can use the info email on the website uh, and you can also uh, follow us on um, on instagram as well just search for uh, dark horse cycling uh, one word again drk um it just i guess that's that's how it goes today <laughs> so. And I'll include all my info and the links um, in the description. Thanks for tuning in and uh, we'll see you next week. Cheers. Great. Thanks, Thanks Paul. Stuff.